Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm so pleased to uh, I'm so pleased that you've joined us today for our conversation about restorative responses to adversity and trauma in schools. My name is Pat Lewis, and I'm going to be your host for this session. I would, uh, you know, adversity and trauma in schools and schools responding to it is not something new. Um, they have always been responsive to the needs of their staff their students and their community. But the pandemic introduced some new adversity and some new traumas and schools grappled with and found ways to respond to um, those new challenges. And today's conversation is really about sharing strategies that my guests have um, developed uh, and have applied over the course of the last couple of years to address those new adversity and traumas as well as the old. Um, so I'm really excited to introduce them to you. But before I do that, I just have a few things to share. Um, one is some housekeeping uh, notes for you. So we would uh, encourage you to use the chat um, throughout this conference. The chat has been used, I think, in great ways to really enhance everybody's learning. Uh, when you do use the chat, please select the everyone button so that we can all see what you are sharing. And remember that closed captioning and translation services are available if you choose to use those. I'd also like to take out oh, one more housekeeping piece. If you could please use the uh, Q&A button to post your questions, uh, that would be really helpful um, for us. And I would invite everybody in the chat right now just to uh, introduce themselves and let us know where you're coming from. It's always great to know um, who's, who's joining us. I also wanna take a moment before introducing our panelists today to, um, to honor and acknowledge our sponsor. Um, our sponsor for this session is the New Press. The New Press amplifies progressive voices for a more inclusive, just and equitable world. A nonprofit public interest publisher, the New Press is a font of progressive thought, leveraging books, diverse voices, and media engagement to enrich public discourse, to defend democratic values, and facilitate social change. Home to leading progressive thinkers, journalists, scholars, political leaders, and activists. The New Press supports social movements that drives narrative change with books on criminal justice, education, labor, immigration, race equity, media reform, economic inequality, gender, civic engagement, and democracy. Please visit thenewpress.com to experience the breadth of voices contributing to a more inclusive, just, and equitable world. Okay, I'd like to introduce our panelists now. And as I introduce them, I would invite them to uh, turn on their cameras and join me here. First up, I'd like to introduce you to Michelle Ingethron. Michelle is Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools in the Wichita Public School District. Throughout her career, Michelle has been very interested in building um, connection and collaboration, and as she's worked in different roles within the Wichita Public School District to make that happen, to actualize that in her school. Next up, I would like to introduce you to Darren Bell. Darren is a restorative uh, practitioner trainer who received the State of Ohio Department of Youth Services Community Service Award in 2016 for his work inside juvenile detention facilities. Darren has participated in global, statewide, and Midwest regional trainings as a lead facilitator for school districts, faith-based organizations, community after-school program sites, college mentoring programs, and youth mental health agency. He's also the creator of My Music Ed app, a social emotional learning app. Welcome, Darren. Next, I'd like to introduce Brandon Johnson. Uh, Brandon is a husband, father, lifelong learner, and the executive director of secondary schools and leadership in the Wichita public school system. In his role, he coaches, supports, 
and challenges the secondary principals to be the best version of themselves for their faculty, staff, students, and community. And welcome, Brandon. And lastly, but not leastly, I'd like to introduce Claudine Miles. In 2018, Claudine launched a consulting firm called Restore More, which has a central mission to continue sharing wellness strategies nationwide to uplift communities of color. Prior to founding Restore More, Claudine was a teacher leader at Kip Waves Academy, a Title I charter school in Atlanta, Georgia. During her 10 years there, she served in several roles, including Dean of Restorative Practices. In 2016, Claudine won Teacher of the Year and led her school to winning Charter School of the Year. Welcome, Claudine, and thank you all for joining us on this panel as we explore ways that restorative practices can be used and can help us to address adversity and harm that our schools are experiencing, have been experiencing for years and maybe are experiencing in a more acute way um, as a result of the global pandemic. So we're going to um, get jump in right away with uh, an initial invitation to our panelists to share a little bit more information about um, who you are uh, and also describe the work that you are engaged in with and how that builds stronger communities and that fare well when faced with adversity and, and trauma. So sharing the work that you do that helps to build those strong communities. And Claudine, I would like to start with you. And if you could take three or four minutes to share that uh, your response to that question, it'd be wonderful. Thank you so much. Good morning or afternoon, based on where you are and what hour it might be based on time zone. I am elated to be here today. Um, as Pat kindly read in my bio, I am a former science teacher, a former assistant principal. I've been a school board member. Um, but in 2018, I was burnt out with the workload, with being a new mom, with being a new wife. And I started to think about all the challenges that I was seeing in schools in neighboring districts and feeling really frustrated because my school had just transitioned to a restorative approach. And I was seeing all of this like incredible, powerful change um, with kids that looked like me and learning new practices and developing social emotional skills that I hadn't seen before. And I thought these kids will be okay because the systems are in place and the right people are there, but how do we ensure other kids get this? And I took the most massive leap of faith I've probably ever taken in 2018. And I started my own business um, along with my amazing partner, uh, Kimberly Milton, who is my best friend, godmother to my baby. And um, in four years, we've become a million dollar international consulting firm, which is really humbling and really scary to say out loud. But I think it underscores what's most important in all of this is like this work is life changing for kids. This work is life changing for adults. Um, and there's a deep desire, particularly coming um, through this pandemic, and I say through, not out of, but through this pandemic, like, we need deep healing, we need reconciliation, we need more love, um, we absolutely need more repairing of harm that's been done. And um, this is a really straightforward, clean way to do it. And so I'm just honored um, to get to support schools across the country and outside of the country in doing this work. Um, our core focus at Restore More is restorative practices, anti-racism, social emotional learning, and teacher wellness. We think those are four things that really matter most and that often aren't being discussed in school. So I sit in that pocket and I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I am eager to get into today's discussion and I just thank you for the floor and the opportunity to introduce myself. Thank you, Claudine. Brandon, can I move to you next? Take a few minutes and introduce yourself a little bit more deeply and uh, share a bit about the work that you're doing. Absolutely, thank you, Pat. Uh, yeah, my name is Brandon Johnson. I'm located in Wichita, Kansas. Um, my colleague, Michelle, and I uh, work for Wichita Public Schools. And uh, right now, um, we are currently working on making sure that we um, introduced, get everyone trained to restorative practices at the adult level. So because both of us sit at central office, uh, we actually have a district-wide plan for all of our adults to be fully trained within a three-year cycle, um, because in our opinion, restorative practices isn't like a curriculum that you introduce when it comes to like math or ELA, where that really is teacher-led and student-directed. Restorative practices is a full community 
uh, practice in which all the adults within that system have to be trained to understand the language and then actually do the practices themselves in being restorative. So that really is our mission and vision right now is that we don't want to just do restorative practices to our adults. We want to be a restorative community as a district. So we have over 90 buildings plus all of our non attendance centers and we want to get all those adults trained first. And then as we build out the capacity within our own system, we want to make that trickle down into the classroom for our students so that we become a forever restorative community, not a part time restorative community. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. Um, at times, it's very difficult because you have to help challenge paradigms and and tell people that up front, if you spend the time correctly investing in the right processes, it will pay off in the long run. Um, I would say the biggest thing for me is personally, it's changed who I am as a human being. It's changed how I interact with my own wife, my own family, um, how I interact with my colleagues here at work. And most importantly, I just think that it's going to make Wichita a better community, which in the long run will make everybody else a better place and a safer place. So grateful for this opportunity. I hope that I can add value today and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. We're uh, looking forward to hearing more about that project. Um, Michelle, um, can you pick up and <clears throat> from there and just introduce yourself a little bit more and, and talk about the work that you're doing? Absolutely. I'm Michelle Ingenthrone. Um, Brandon is uh, this, my secondary counterpart. I work um, within the elementary office with elementary schools and the elementary system. Um, you know, Brandon and I, I think we both have this same passion. So everything he said, I would completely agree with that work that we're doing. Um, for me, I have also um, taken on some, uh, some pride and some um, some passion in working with our operations side, our facilities, um, even in with our HR. You know, think of all of the offices in a central office that or in a district that make up the district, all of our supports. All of our supports are in-house down to nutrition services, um, you know, busing, all of that. So working with all of these um, other sort of what people may consider outliers in education, not directly in a school, um, and changing culture. I mean, I really think that's what restorative practices is helping us do in a district to creating a culture of opportunity and expectation for all. Not only the kids that are sitting in our classrooms, um, you know, we're finding that still in the pandemic, Claudine, right, still working through that, um, we find that our culture has changed somewhat from what it was pre-pandemic. Um, and so creating those opportunities and creating for kids, for teachers, and, and for those of, of us in support roles um, to be involved in this process, um, to move to be more restorative as a, as a district, but then also now kind of looking outside into the community as well to say, it can't just be us in this building, in this system, in, this, in our space, we need our community partners as well. And so pushing to, to get uh, this message to those in the community who would want to engage with us in this process. So that's that's the work that we're doing. Thank you, Michelle. And Darren, can I move on to you to share a little bit more about yourself and the work that you're involved in? Thank you. Welcome everyone today. Uh, my name is Darren Bell, based out of Dayton, Ohio. And as Pat mentioned, um, and reading uh, my bio, a uh, short caption has stuck out when we received the award of our work um, in 2016 uh, from the state of Ohio. Um, we were actually working inside multiple juvenile detentions, um, um, you know, doing circle practices and connecting with those youth through the arts, through the, through the music, um, through technology, in a sense of on the other side of, of um, as a practitioner of restorative practices, um, we are uh, an app developer. So um, connecting with young people. Um, is very important. You know, we can do the practices all day, but are we using tools that can connect with them to keep their interest over time? So we were fortunate in 2019 to partner with City Day Community Schools, a K-8 building, um, where we've been able to implement circle practices along with arts practices, you know. So imagine kindergarten students, first grade, even all the way up to eighth grade that can log into an app, do, um, do music in, uh, engagement things, but at the same time, restorative practices in 
and SEL, social emotional learning tools that are built inside the app. So it's a positive approach to connecting with young people and even equally important, uh, we do professional developments and coachings with staff. So we take a building a wide approach through the arts and through the practices that um, has, as of 2022, have a slated to be one of the um, best schools in Dayton. Uh, and we'll see how that outcomes come. So um, we're glad to be doing the work. Thank you so much. Thank you all for sharing. Um, the first question that uh, I'm going to pose, I'd like to pose, has to do with something that many of you mentioned, which is the pandemic and um, and how schools, you know, some, some new challenges, some new adversities, some new traumas, how schools have um, responded in ways uh, to support uh, students and staff and and all everyone engaged in in our education communities. And the question is, what challenges related to pandemic recovery are educators continuing to face? And then in the next round, we'll talk about ways that we've, we've, you have responded. So what are the challenges that you've noted? Um, and Brandon, I'd like to start this round with you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just speak from a secondary lens so that uh, I, don't, I don't take all of the opportunities that we have as a district to uh, after the pandemic. So from a secondary lens, which is sixth through 12th grade here in Wichita Public Schools, I would say we have seen a lot more tier three behaviors with uh, a student to student violence has gone up a little bit in our system. Um, students ability to regulate before they make a uh, extreme decision on, you know, reacting in a way has gone up. Um, another thing that I've noticed is that we, I think when we were away from each other for a while for about a year, we kind of lost that ability to naturally connect and communicate with each other verbally and interact in a tight, you know, hallway or a restroom environment, things like that. So little things are kind of were upsetting our kids with each other because they had lost that kind of like that interaction and how to handle those kind of things when someone bumps into you on accident or intentionally and how to regulate correctly. Um, and now to to our adults, we we got used to a certain expectation that might not have been great with student behavior before the pandemic. And when we came back, we had a lot of peace and quiet at home. And it was a lot of noise and loud when we came back and we kind of had high expectations of students acting correctly. Um, and they weren't always following suit. So some of our adults were quick to throw kids out of class and say, this is not acceptable and things like that. And we had to help kind of help regulate our adults as well, like back into this and understanding being patient with them, just like we need to be patient with ourselves. So I would say tier three behaviors with violent activities towards each other and even towards the adults, unfortunately, we do have some kids who are lashing out towards our adults in different ways. Um, and we're not, you know, we're not accepting of that. There's multiple, obviously consequences and things for all those things that happen, but um, it's, it's not something we can't fix, but it is something that we have to address directly and something we have to have provide support for. So that's what I would say right now. It's just the violence between the students is probably the worst part. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brandon. Michelle, would you like to um, speak to the same question? Yeah, and I think for us in elementary, we're in the same district, but for us in elementary, it, it really has been an influx of our primary kiddos, right? Our, our K-1, 2s, we even see it with our pre-K students. Um, just not having the social skills needed, knowing, you know, kids come to us from all different walks of life and all different experiences and we meet them where they are, but we're struggling with some of our kids to meet them where they are. Um, and so I think for, for us, you know, all of, I echo all of those things Brandon said about relationships, but I think in elementary for us, it really is, um, you know, we need to teach in the with. Right, we're out of the pandemic. We were very much, you know, we're going to sit and get. We got, we got back in rows, um, and it's been hard for us to get out of rows. And so that collaboration, we we're not fostering the sense of community like we would. Um, and our implementation has been, it's a three-year implementation. So we have 56 elementary schools. 27 of them have have gone through. Um, the, the intro to re to restorative with each other. So we still have work to do. And the good news is we're seeing pockets, right? Those places where um, principals are leading the work and they're building a sense of community and students are back to collaborating with each other. We are seeing um, much less of those behaviors. We still have our our students who need additional help, obviously, because we, we need to, to help them adjust 
themselves to, to life outside of their home. But um, while we are facing some, some issues, I'm excited in, for those pockets that we're seeing that are using restorative um, we're clarifying misconceptions about the need for punishment um, and how, you know, if, if we can be collaborative and build a sense of community, there are oftentimes less needs when it comes to pun the less opportunity to punish, if you want to, if I could say it that way, maybe is um, so I'm, ex I'm excited. It's still rough, but I'm excited that we are headed in the right way. Thank you, Michelle. And Darren and Claudine, you both work sort of uh, externally supporting schools. Um, so Darren, can I pose the same question to you? So what challenges related to pandemic recovery have you noticed that educators and schools are facing? Uh, one of the things at the top of the list that, that, um, that we've seen um, is the increase in the impact of social media of negative behaviors. Um, things that are actually happening outside the schools that are happening online at the midnight hour throughout the day. And um, the school setting can be positive in a sense, but then we have the impact of what's happening in social media with several students that bridge over into the school, you know, whether it's cyberbullying taking place there, whether it's students that are pulling other students in chat conversations that turn negative, and then it spills over. But fortunately, there are circle practices in place to address it, but definitely see, have seen a significant increase in the impact of social media. Thank you. And Claudine? My colleagues have shared so much great insight. And I think what's so unique is like, we're kind of scattered around the country um, with the exception of Brandon and Michelle who are together. Um, but we're seeing so many similarities and it kind of just reminds me of that with and togetherness of restorative practices and how much power is in this just room today because we're like-minded folks talking about hard things. So I want to stick to something different. And so I think one of the things that I am noticing um, in relation to the pandemic is the teacher shortage. Um, it is heavily weighing on educators. And if you've done this work at any point in schools, you know that when a teammate is out on your grade level, it has a huge impact. It either means a sub or you lose a planning period. Bringing in that sub, especially when the school is restorative, actually creates a lot of challenges because the students and culture of the school is restorative and the sub may or may not um, be well-versed in that. And so we see a lot of tension points there. Um, but I think what I see most is teachers, you know, voicing their exhaustion and their frustration and rightfully so, right? They're being oftentimes overworked or pulled to step in the gap. And I think it's frustrating from all ends, right? Like I've been the teacher's teacher, I've been the leader's leader. It's frustrating for the leader to have to make an alternate schedule that eats your planning. It's frustrating to have to get subs that are not the same quality as our staff. Like that's not a win uh, within leadership either, but it's very clear like that's the reality, right? And I, it makes me wonder like, how do we bring in more community to support that challenge? Because I don't believe like, schools alone can fix it, right? There's a pipeline issue. And so when I think about the solution, it's like, how do we tap into the teacher prep programs in college and get them to do some of their, their service work in our schools and get them started with restorative practices early? So when they come in, logically, it is in this foreign concept. But I know many times leaders are overworked and burnt out and tired. And so it, it it really mm -hmm. halts that collaboration because those systems don't naturally exist, even though it sounds really logical and practical. Um, and it's often daring and bold leaders. I'm pointing to like Michelle and Brandon who say, I'm going to take this on and lead it in my district. Like in my own school, it was my one self who started the restorative practice um, initiative and rolled out a three year program and transitioned the school from what was honestly, you know, a punitive system to being just completely and vastly different. And in our first year, we had a 27% decrease in suspensions. And so then our entire um, charter network district did implement that change. But I think it, it's really challenging to think about this teacher shortage because the answer doesn't just lie with the schools, right? It's, it's gonna involve some systemic change, more partnership, more collaboration, a more restorative approach. <laughs> I'll leave it there. 
perfect place to leave it. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your responses. Um, I'm going to um, stay with kind of challenges for a bit, and then we'll we'll move toward um, not solutions, but uh, approaches that that you've found successful. So for each of you, and for this one, Michelle, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Um, from your perspective, Michelle, what is the what are the one or two biggest barriers to building strong, resilient communities in which both school students and staff and community and, and families can thrive? Like what are those one or two really big challenges? Um, well, you know, for us as a society, I'm gonna kind of get back to that punishment piece too, right? Uh, is when you do something wrong, there's a consequence and there should be a consequence. There are natural consequences and there are consequences within systems. Um, and so, but that has been um, one of our biggest barriers in our district is the concept that restorative practices means that there are no consequences, right? That, they're, that we're not having discipline any longer. Uh, so that has been a barrier for us, which to me seems um, ridiculous. I don't know if I can if I can say that right. Um, but I so I think what that is is a there's a a barrier between hearts and minds, right? So in my mind, we have a hearts and mind change that needs to happen in a big system. We have to continue to be rooted in this message of. Um, we have to build relationships first, right? Um, that is so important. And we have, our superintendent has a, um, a, a group of students from high schools. There's a representative who come and she calls it her uh, student advisory and I'm treading on Brandon's world now. Um, but once in a while, I'm lucky enough to sit in on that. And Brandon and I ask that student advisory, what is it that you need? What, what is it that you're missing? And overwhelmingly, it was they needed relationships. They didn't feel like they had relationships with their teachers. They didn't feel like they had relationships with their fellow students. Um, and they were all in for, let us work in the with with our teachers. We want our teachers to be with us, right? We want to be with, in that with box, with our fellow classmates. But they don't, they don't know how to do that, right? And so... It is a, for the adults, um, we have to change their hearts and their minds, and we have to uh, roll out, and these are the things that Brandon and I are talking about, um, you know, work with our administrators to help them understand that leading for us in this district now is leading through this lens of the social discipline window and leading with equity and opportunity. So. Um, and maybe just one more point to make about the punishment pieces. You know, we oftentimes punish kids. Uh, we take them out of classrooms because they are not engaged. They're bored. They want to be engaged in, in this work. So we are in essence to me, and I heard somebody say this, it's not necessarily an achievement gap that we are experiencing. It's an opportunity gap for kids to participate. Uh, academically and socially, and a gap in our expectations of kids. So. Thank you, Michelle. Darren, what would you uh, what would you suggest are the biggest barriers to building those strong, resilient school communities that we all want? What do you see as being those one or two uh, significant ones? Yeah, sometimes barriers can just be effective communication or the lack thereof, um, especially when we're um, integrating in restorative, you know, circle practices and models. So, yes, when it comes to, you know, it's one thing to say, well, hey, we're about to have a PD, you know, a parent PD, a student PD, a staff PD on these new practices. But that information must be delivered to all parties because it's a building wide approach just as well as I feel a community approach. You know, if we're 
if, if we're, we're just working with the teachers and just working with volunteers to the school, but that information isn't getting to the parents, then, there, then there's a barrier there because it's like good things are happening, but then it can backfire later on when a parent comes and go, oh, well, I just didn't know. And then there's sometimes a barrier developed when there is the expectation, you know, when my student is dropped off to the school, you will have all these people there, you're the cure-all. But wait a minute, but we need a relationship with you all so we can continue to grow together. So I would say barriers can be, you know, effective or ineffective communication, but the building wide approaches do work, but it can be a barrier sometime when the information isn't um, disseminated all together at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. And Claudine, how would you, how would you chime in on that question? I think one of the things that I notice is that there is a lack of like focus on wellness for all of our stakeholders, right? Whether that be leaders um, in district seats, leaders in school seats, teachers, um, support staff, parents, kids. I think we're all really clear, like this pandemic has shaken us to our core. We have gone through a thing that many of us like never fathomed going through. I have a seven-year-old, right? And when this started, he was five. He spent his entire first year of kindergarten in his bedroom. Mm -hmm. That is such an important year to be socialized. And so everything that he knows about school has this shield over it of it's like unsafe. You have to wear a mask. You have to be really cautious. Like, and I am very clear that is deeply impacting him. And he's seven. I think about how it's impacted me as an individual. I'm 37 and I am struggling many days <laughs> to process how drastically things have changed in our world. And I think we were so eager to get back into our classrooms because we missed our kids. We missed the face-to-face -face that we started opening textbooks and went right to teaching and it backfired. It's done a, a disservice. We didn't take enough time, I posit, in building relationships, in building culture, in practicing strong routines. Like how do you get up and raise your hand to sharpen a pencil, teaching them, giving praise when they do a good job, making competitions. Like, did we take the time to teach culture explicitly or I'm gonna head over to Andre in the chat, did we just rush to get back to normal, right? And it's like, people were trying to call it the new normal, but I don't even think we addressed the harm. So like from a restorative standpoint, it just seemed so misaligned. We understood there was this huge social emotional gap. Like we said it, woo, they are coming with a lack of social skills. And we said, open your books, let's learn. <laughs> Sometimes just when you say things really simply and plain, it seems so um, simply flawed, right? And I think when we notice those things, the challenge is how do you slow down enough to fix it? Because education is very much um, a field that has a, a sense of urgency to it, right? We've got a year to make these gains and everyone riding the boat feels that pressure. But also if we only focus on academics and the engagement of said academics isn't high, then we're actually not growing our students. They're probably becoming more disinvested in this learning process. And I don't ever think it's too late to get back to like matters of the heart. I think it can always be redeemed. I do think we've got to really be strategic and just intentional about what's most important when. Thank you so much, Claudine. Um, Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, so I'll just say ditto to what everybody else just said. I don't think I have like, what I'm gonna say isn't more important than what they said. All of those things are probably at the top of my list as well. Um, so, I'll, so here's some context I'll add from what maybe I didn't hear that might be good. One, I would say, I don't think that every individual who talks about being restorative is restorative. And I think that's a big issue currently that all of us are dealing with in any kind of restorative work is that we might be able to talk about it. We can throw out the words, we can talk about the continuum. We can say that we're restorative, but then our actions don't follow suit. So I think that's still something that we're struggling with um, in, in any of us who are leading kind of restorative work is that people will tell you they are, but then their actions don't follow suit. So how do you coach them? How do you help them? How do you get them to the place where they are restorative? Because, and Michelle will tell you that I say this all the time, being restorative isn't about what other people do, it's about what you do. 
Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I own. There's probably everybody in this room probably says that to their people. And we have to be restorative if we truly want it to be a thing, because we have to live those actions every day with the people that we lead, that we get to in, inform and we get to model with. Um, so that'd be one thing. Second, I would say go to what Claudine was talking about. We have tried to actually start our year off with restorative practices training before we get any kind of curriculum, any kind of everything else, so that our adults are talking to each other and establishing built-in relationships before the school year starts. And then we give them the same permission to do that with their kids when they start the school year. So like, hey, don't jump right into talking about this is how you're gonna be successful. How about you just start with, hey, how are you? Who are you? What are you about? What do you like? This is what I like and getting to build relationships. So Michelle and our district and I, we have been very intentional about making sure that we start our school year off with back to school with teachers and the adults without kids. We start that way so that we can help them understand it's okay to slow down, get to know each other, and then you can start opening textbooks and then you can start talking about how you're going to be successful after you build established relationships. So um, helping the adults understand that they can slow down, get to know each other first, and then do the same exact thing with their kids. And the only way that happens is if we model that as a district leadership team. We can't expect something to be done that we don't show them how to do it. So wonderful. Thank you for um, all your contributions. Definitely the pandemic did not come with a roadmap <laughs> for you know, recovery. Um, and, and all of us, I think you in particular in your work with schools, you are developing, you're drafting that, that roadmap for how do we come out of this? Um, and in, in a way that um, we're proud of the strength uh, and the skills and the uh, benefits of, it, of that community. So I'd like to move into uh, a round of, of questions around what you think, what you are doing, what you think needs to be done. And I'm, and I'm gonna uh, phrase this in terms of um, like what changes do you think need to be made immediately? or what changes are you making immediately? So what do we need to do kind of as soon as possible? Uh, Claudine, you mentioned an urgency, you know, that there's a, um, there's some urgency, particularly maybe because we got it wrong <laughs> out of the gates, you know, so what do, we, what do we need to do right away? What needs to be more carefully planned to be addressed? So what's gonna take longer and needs more careful planning? And um, it what- It like froze out for me for a moment. Oh, sorry about that. No worries. Okay, I'm just going to um, resume. So, <laughs> okay. so immediate changes or immediate issues that can be addressed and how might they be addressed? What needs to be, is going to require more careful planning, needs to take a little bit longer. And then uh, what partners and community supports are needed? Uh, you mentioned about, Claudine, early on, you mentioned about the, you know, that schools aren't equipped for a lot of reasons to be able to do this. Um, yeah. on their own. And so what partners are needed, community supports, and how do we engage them? How should they, how, how do they need to be engaged? Um, and Darren, I'm gonna start with you in this round, if that's okay. Um, so immediately, what needs to happen longer term? What do you think needs to happen? And then um, who needs to be involved? What community partners and supports do schools need? Um, for me and my experiences, um, uh, it starts with leadership, and uh, which bridges over into policies and, and expectation. Um, so one thing that um, I have seen that has been um, successful over time is leadership coming together, um, reevaluating, going back through, you know, what does the discipline model, what has it looked like? Um, now let's look at the restorative practices model and integrating those things built in. I'm not talking about just jumping in and an immediate drastic change, but where I have seen success, um, especially at our school, is um, where I've sat down with the superintendent and the principal, and we went back and looked at those policies. We went back and integrated, you know, where for XYZ students do XYZ. Okay, let's say it's a tier three behavior, a suspension or something, but then we looked at the restorative practice that was integrated in that space. And where I'm going with that, there has been significant um, positive input, not only um, uh, modifying the discipline model, um, integrating in restorative practices, but even then getting parents involved. What does that look like? Um, well, 
let's say a suspension just happens to take place, you know, um, but yet before that student returns, we implemented the pre-conferencing, you know, um, um, before that, and then setting up the formal conferences um, have been successful. Now we're many years into this, but one thing I would definitely say is just looking at policies and expectations, integrating in practices for intentional change. Um, and, um, and lastly, what I would say another, uh, what I would describe as best practice for us has been quarterly addressing and looking at things intentionally versus what would typically pre uh, pandemic was an annual training or an annual, you know, professional development, um, doing things more, more parent meetings quarterly in, intentionally for positive change, but the platforms and the opportunities have to be built into schedules, I would recommend quarterly so they're consistent and there can be positive social impact just as well inside the school community for a paradigm shift. Thank you, Darren. Um, and next up, um, Claudine, can I come to you next? Yes. Um, I think in terms of like the, the fast change, one of the things that people were really excited about in the beginning of the pandemic was like, this is gonna be it. This is gonna be the thing that creates so much innovation in education because look, everyone has learned how to become a virtual teacher literally overnight. Um, we're, we're trying these new tools. And so when we come back, it's gonna be so different. And that didn't happen. And so I wonder, you know, in this season, when we're looking for fast change, like what does it look like to enlist community support and have listening sessions about what parents actually want to see in schools, what kids want to see in schools, what staff want to see in schools, but also partners, right? If we are oftentimes lacking partners, it's important to get with them, find that restorative approach. What is the synergy? You know, they need oftentimes students to provide their services or people, right? And so we know at schools, we have tons of people. We, we deal in people all day. It is our currency. And so I think that was a missed opportunity early on, like not slowing down enough to listen and assess, like what do the stakeholders, the people who spend the most time in those spaces and are impacted most by those spaces, what do they value in terms of like school culture, discipline, this restorative approach? Um, I also think bringing parents along on the journey is so critical, right? And so one of the things that we do at Restore More is like we offer parent services because while teachers need this training for, for this work and we offer that as well, we leave parents behind and we're like, we're just doing this restorative thing to your kid. See that there? To your kid. We're not doing it with them. And so even when we implemented it in my school to Darren's point, I was calling parents before a repair harm circle. I was talking to them for 20, 30 minutes and asking them the four restorative questions. They were getting prepped. And then they would come in and sit in circle about whatever the incident was. In the beginning of the year, we had a kickoff about restorative practices. We explained what it was. And then we had workshops throughout the year that actually aligned to like parent skill set, right? So managing the over emotional team. I had literally some of the parents I had never seen show up. Because oftentimes it's those same parents that are coming to us and saying, I don't know what to do with them, help. So if we can think innovatively about the content we provide to parents, instead of always offering similar things, we know the deal, back to school night, math night, fine arts night, like there are the consistent staples in school, but are we offering content that grows parents' skill set in this restorative practice as well, so that they're backing us up at home and they're growing and learning? Um, when it comes to, I think the change that needs to be more planned and intentional, I just immediately think about learning and, and curriculum. Those are two big glaring like red flags for me currently. Um, oftentimes like curriculum is lacking in its depth and breadth, sometimes accuracy, but that's another story for another day. Uh, but I do think the way in which we have students learn in school is probably like the least innovative area in a variety of fields like think about any other field like medicine right if you think about medicine 100 years ago there's been a ton of innovation we would all be dead if we were using the same tools that they tried to use 100 years ago but when you think about schools 100 years ago there were desks they faced forward the teachers sat in the front the kids came there and learned from a certain time to a certain time that revolved around America's work schedule <laughs> we feed them we send them home they have a bus 
Like for the most part, those things are still intact and we haven't innovated. We haven't come up with unique schedules for parents who have unique schedules. We haven't provided uh, consistent alternate paths to learning. We don't often differentiate well. We don't have unique learning plans for kids who are obsessed with coding or that new thing that could change the world. It's one size fits all. And I don't know where that works in many spaces, but because we've been doing it for so long, we keep doing it. And so I think there needs to be a lot of planning around that because if we can engage our kids more to Michelle's point, if we make learning fun and exciting, people will come to school. Um, they say kids learn the most when they don't realize they're learning. So how can we make them have fun and like trick them? And that's our job, right? Like our job is to make them fall in love with it, but that's a process and it takes time. My final thought is when it comes to like partners and community supports, Schools need to leverage more wraparound services. And there are so many great nonprofits in the community doing this work, but schools are often overburdened and so busy that they don't even know who the people in the community are, oftentimes doing that work, or they're not connected and plugged in, or they can't get a hold of a person, right? Like those are literal breakdowns. But in some of the schools that are thriving and have the best results, like throughout our country, particularly with um, disadvantaged students, it's the schools that are around services and offering things like food pantries and laundry service and to work and all the things that many of our communities need. Like we all know about Maslow's. I am not ready to sit in a seat and learn if my basic needs are not met. And if we all clearly know that, right? Think about how many kids we let come into our building that needs are not met and we just hope that they get it. When we slow down and like say it out loud, it just doesn't seem logical. So how do we enlist community support to basically knock and bang on the doors of the board members so that we can get policy changed and passed in ways that's really most effective for our schools. And I say that being an individual who actually got policy passed in Atlanta that impacted 53,000 kids, and I did that not by myself, but with community support. I started gathering like-minded folks and I said, black and brown kids are being oversuspended it's really problematic. So much so that they're more likely to get involved in the juvenile justice system and then prison later on. If you're interested in this, come meet me at this place. I'll get you dinner. We'll talk about it. And lawyers showed up and judges showed up and teachers showed up and nonprofit people showed up. Like people that just gave a damn. Like <laughs> Mr. Rogers says, they'll oh, you'll, if you look, you'll find the helpers. Like the helpers came. And then we started tweeting the school board. And lo and behold, the school board was equally interested in this issue, but they felt like they didn't have enough community support. And so now when we've got like 500 stakeholders, oh, it was very easy to get policy passed. It took us a year and a half, but we now have policy in an Atlanta public school that says every student before suspension deserves a restorative intervention. And like, here are the approaches. And that was a huge win. Um, and it just started with talking and doing things with people rather than we know what you need, and we'll do it to you or for you. We do that a lot of times to our partners, to our parents, and to our stakeholders. And we don't realize it because we've been doing it for a little while. Thank you, Claudine, for sharing all of that. Um, I think the um, I'm really struck by your story about the community stakeholders, um, you know, engaging with the school and the school having the same concerns, but not knowing what to do, whether there was community support, like unless we come together and talk, we, we don't even recognize that we have the same, you know, the same goals and the same hopes. So thank you so much for all that sharing. Brandon, can I come to you next? So it's sort of the immediately what, what needs to be done or what could be done more long-term and how do we engage community partners and supports for the work? Uh, I like the immediate word. I was thinking what can be done quickly, and I was like, well, nothing can be done quickly. This is this takes time. Um, but immediately, I would say don't expect anything out of anyone that you haven't trained them on or you don't provide them the right support on. So I think sometimes in at least education, I can't talk about in other settings, we expect people to do things really well without providing them either an upfront training or a scaffolding along the way that allows them to fail at something, but then they can come back and get support to say, this is how you can do that better. And thank you for trying instead of like, you know, scolding them for not doing it right. So anything that you want to implement restorative practices, 
please make sure that you have adequate training up front and then adequate support along the way. And you don't just do one-offs. Like don't just bring someone in for a day, talk about restorative practices and then walk away from it. You have to be intentional about long-term planning. That's your immediate role. You have to provide the right support and training up front because it's not something that you can just do overnight. It, it takes time. Um, I would say the second thing to do is when you think about who you want to impact is students and students are impacted by adults. So if you're not taking care of the adults the right way, they won't be able to take care of the students. So don't expect that student results like suspensions and things will go down if you're not using fair process with your adults, if you're not doing uh, restorative um, conferences when you cause harm as a leader, like making sure you own that, bringing someone in, healing those things. Uh, next thing I would probably talk about is whenever you are using uh, restorative practices, name it. Like, hey, we just did this. That was fair process. That's how this decision was made. Here's the clear expectation moving forward and, and call those things out. So if you actually call out the practices that you're utilizing with the people you're trying to influence and how that positively impacted your community, you'll get more people who are not willing to jump on board first to get on board because they see positive from it. But don't assume they know that it was if you don't tell them. Um, what's another thing I could probably add? I would say, Whenever someone tells you up front when you've done restorative practices that they need data to show that it's working, tell them in what other world and what other initiative do we implement something right away and it works right away. Name, name one thing that's ever been true. And then you would say, correct, nothing. It takes time. And if you're expecting data to improve, then you need adults to improve how they interact with those things. Um, we just get a lot of people kind of push back. Well, tell me, how are all the suspensions? How are blah, blah, blah? Guys, we're, this is our second year doing this. What are you talking about? Like, don't, don't you think we'd have ACT scores figured out by now if it was just easy to do overnight? Like, this takes time. So um, I would just say, you know, restorative practices isn't just about being kind and, and being passive. It's also about being a strong leader and making clear decisions that are best for your people. And if you truly are a restorative person, you will make quick, decisive decisions as long as you have the right feedback to make that decision before you move forward. Um, so it's... It's uh, uh, we don't have it figured out in Wichita Public Schools, but we are definitely on the journey of getting feedback and making it done the right way as uh, hopefully as we go. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Michelle, tough yeah, one to be the last that, in the rotation on. I know. <laughs> uh, I'm not <laughs> sure what that's. Yeah, I'm not sure what's left to say um, other than thinking about um, some low hanging fruit. Right. And I think maybe for us, the low hanging fruit um, are our leaders, our building leaders, right? They are the ones that define the culture. Uh, they are the ones that, as Brandon said, have to call out to staff and say, this process we're going through is in the with. This is what instruction looks like when you are in the with box mm -hmm. with kids, right? Um, and so mm -hmm. leaning into them and continuing to give them additional professional learning opportunities, um, and you know, we're doing some putting theory into practice sessions with them specifically to say, this is how you can lead in your building and to be a multiplier in your building, right? And I'm sure uh, we are not the only district that has multiple initiatives at the same time, right? Especially uh, with all of the ESSER dollars that are thrown at uh, public schools in, in the United States right now. And so it is finding a way, I think, for this important relationship work to be interwoven into everything that we do. And so being able to make connections, I think, is something that we have tried to do immediately to say this work with restorative practices um, also impacts these other areas, these other initiatives that we're doing. And because if you don't align that for people, um, you know, if you if you are a teacher and you feel overwhelmed um, and things are hectic and you're dealing with behaviors that you've never had to deal with before, it's hard to see how things interconnect. And so um, for me, that's important. I think that is that is the place where we start is with our leaders. And we're fortunate to, enough to be working with IIRP and, and have some coaches for our principals, mm -hmm. right? Somebody that is that's not myself, it's not Brandon, it's not somebody else that is their supervisor. Um, and it's that safe space of learning. So I think even sometimes, you know, having, having a resource outside of your district that can help support your school leaders um, is very important. 
the the other thing you know you you mentioned Claudine the you know the work that you did with policy work to be able to give kids sort of that fair shake of trying to be restorative before a, a, something would happen. Brandon and I have been working to change part of our system too with, with hearings, right, and expulsions to say, do we need to take every, every one of these X, Y, Z or behaviors to hearing if we can have a restorative conference with all parties, right, and we can come to an agreement, there's still, again, for those people that are hooked on punishment, right, and the consequence, there's still going to be a consequence. But do we really need to uproot a kiddo and send them someplace else and send the message that they're not good enough to stay in our building and we don't believe that they can be better, right, and we're here to help them be better. So, um, for me, those are the needs that need to be addressed. And I think all of those can also be spread out into the community and ask those in our community are the places our kids go before school and after school and on the weekends and churches and, and all of the organizations that support families to say, let's do this all together um, for a better community, right? Not just a better school system, but for a better community and a better way of life for all of us. Thank you, Michelle. That was, um, you wrapped up that round so lovely. Appreciate it. Um, I see that there's lots of questions in the Q&A and I'm, I'm looking at the time as well. I'm wondering if I can ask uh, maybe a quicker last round and uh, call on Claire to organize some of the questions or to review some of the questions in the Q&A. Perfect. Um, to pose. Um, are you good with that? We take some questions from uh, attendees. Great. Um, Claire, maybe we'll, I'm looking at quite a few questions. Maybe we'll, we should go to the questions and then I'll ask my, my quick question round um, after we do some Q&A. Yes, of course. Um, I, do, I just wanna say, we do have a lot of questions in the Q&A and some of them are also expressing a lot of love and inspiration for the work that you do. Um, in general, I think people are very interested in learning more about your work, learning more about research practices, implementation, I'm sorry, and knowing how to connect with you afterwards. So if it's possible for, for you to share some contact information in the chat, Claudine, I, I see that you're doing it already. I know that people will really appreciate it. Um, many of the questions have to do with buy-in from administrators, teachers, and families. I just want to quote one of them that literally says, and I really appreciated this question. I thought it was a very, uh, it was a very um, powerful question. Has anyone had success by starting with the youth? So uh, I want to leave you with that first one about buy-in from administrators, teachers, families, the whole community, policymakers. I know you've addressed that, but we really want to hear more. <laughs> Thank you. And I see uh, Claudine, we, shall we start with you? And, and Darren, I saw your hand too. So Claudine and Darren, and then we'll open it up. Yeah, I think it, when I um, started this work, probably in like 2014, 2015, um, at my school, I was an assistant principal. I was Dean of Restorative Practices. That was my title. And I was freaking out because I was like, what is this new approach that y'all are telling me about? That is not new, but it was new to me. Um, and what I realized was, ah, a lot of the things that are happening in this framework or this approach, right? I'm doing this naturally. I didn't realize it, but there are some nuanced components that I can learn and train others on. And I love a good system. Okay. We can make this work once I like wrap my head around it. And I started not only with staff, but with kids, right? So to Brandon's point in that summer onboarding staff was sitting down and circling. We were debriefing every single day and building community. And so likewise, when kids came in, we had a PowerPoint that went out that was student facing that every kid saw that was differentiated by grade level that I made because teachers didn't need to do it. <laughs> and it said, this is what restorative practices is. This is why we're doing it here because y'all keep fighting. Every time you have a conflict, you want to punch someone in the face and it's not working here. It is not working at all. <laughs> we want to introduce this approach. Here's how it will work. And we said, there's going to be a form outside of Miss Miles's office. I believe if I did it today, it would probably be like a Google form. But back then it was a literal half sheet, y'all. So simple. What's the problem? What happened? What were you thinking? What needs to happen to make it right? And we introduced it. And the first week, my little 
like clear box that was attached to the wall outside my office was overflowing and it freaked me out. I was like, oh no, we've opened Pandora's box. Because think about it. What we traditionally do in schools is we say, if we find out you're doing something wrong, we're gonna punish you. And we love punishment. I love that Michelle has been touting that thing because our society has a sick obsession with punishment. And it's like schools are a reflection of society. So we do love to punish. That's why we put people in prison forever. We don't have quality rehabilitation. Again, another topic for another day. But within our school, Oh no, don't lose my thought. I'm trying to bring it back. Within our school, we started this work with the youth. My box is overflowing. And it's because we created a safe space for them to actually tell us about their problems. What they historically had been doing was having problems on social media, having conflict with their friends and hiding it from us. Hiding it from us. We created a system where they're just still doing the things, just being sneaky and not wanting to get caught. When I put the box up, They said, oh, I'm not going to get in trouble if I tell you I want to fight so-and-so. No, you will not get in trouble if you tell me you want to fight them. You'll be in trouble if you fight them. Thank you for telling me. Let's talk about it. Let's work it through. And it was a little overwhelming at first because they were bringing issues that to me seemed really small. This person Mm -hmm. posted this picture about you on social media. And it wasn't anything, you know, if you saw it was egregious. But as I would pull the child look at their form, ask them those four restorative questions, I started to understand, no, it's actually deeper. And I was making a lot of assumptions. Like this has been going on for two weeks on Instagram and they've been harassing them in the DMs and they've been sharing it with friends. And I just made me realize how many assumptions I've probably made over the years and how many times kids are misappropriately suspended because we don't have full context over the situation. We love to be urgent. We love to wrap up a scenario and we love to have it done and nice and neat in a box, but kids get harmed in that process. And sometimes, many times, the wrong kids get punished and kids get punished unfairly. There's really powerful data around one suspension having lasting impact on the life trajectory of children. Just one, y'all, just one heightens their chance to be involved with juvenile justice system or law enforcement. Just one. And yet knowing that we do the opposite, that's the data I want to show people when people ask me if this works, that's not working. (laughs) The other approach is not working. And so what we found was that kids, and it, it blew my mind, that typically would fight first. When they learned a different system and approach to handle it, they used it. They used it so much. And then staff members started putting in circle requests. And then I would have parents call me like Miss Grider, who said, I need your help, Miss Miles. I told Stanley to shut his video game down this weekend. And he went like this at me. He bucked at me. And I was like, wait, he did what? He's, he's still living. I'm so glad he's still alive. I'm proud of you, Miss Grider. She's like, I need a circle because I don't want to hurt him. And she, apparent, like that blew my mind. So I think it's important to understand like everything has to be intentional to Brandon's point. It needs to be rolled out from a systems level. Uh, There needs to be quality training, tools, and support. But when it's done well, humans love resolve. We hate conflict. We like resolve. And sometimes kids just don't know that yet because they're still learning. So if we teach them how to resolve, we can see a lot of positive in that. Thank you, Claudine. Um, Darren, did you want to speak to that question as well? Yes, um, buy-in from students, parents, um, but let's start at the top um, with administrators. Um, It's easy to talk about and recognize the awards from our school, City Day Community School in Dayton, Ohio, from 2019 PBIS awards up to, you know, as early as last year, um, school being recognized for improvements and more, but it's more important to talk about the journey and what mindset and intentions were set in place five years ago when we started there as a community partner and still exist to this day. Yes, as a licensed trainer, do we do training in multiple places? Absolutely. But one thing I will be very honest and very transparent on is making a point of, there's one thing that this school does and have done that was a non-negotiable and they stuck and stick to the restorative practices framework. There is a reason for, and if someone's listening, that when you implement these practices, there's a 
there's a reason for the steps of the readiness phase, phase one. There's a reason for the introduction phase and all the ask and directives that fall under that. Then you move on to the implementation stage, which phases bridges over into the sustainability with hopefully the goals to reach the enrichment phases. When someone wants to implement these practices, we have to go beyond more than circles. We can talk about circles, we can talk about volunteers, but unless someone is working, back to Brandon's point with, and everyone else's, when it comes to training, what I've seen is when the phases of implementations aren't interrupted, oh, we had a good year the first year, we had a good six months, so let's jump from readiness to sustainability. No, you're not there yet. There's a reason to follow the practices in the model with a licensed trainer and make those a non-negotiable. And five years later, we're now seeing the change. It has to be sustained, obviously. But when, my last point, when trainings don't deviate from the restorative practices implementation framework and the reasons behind them, there will, they will be successful. Thank you, Darren. Um, Michelle and, and Brandon, did either did either of you want to chime in on that question or do you want to uh, move to the next question? I'm, I'm good to move to the next okay. question. They, they I should have said up front, you're, you're, you're allowed to pass. <laughs> in the circle passing, so okay. Uh, Brandon, did you want to say anything or we'll move on? I agree, moving on is good, yeah, okay. thank you. Hey, Claire, so is there it. another question? Yes, yes. Uh, well, a, a couple of questions, though. Um, I just want to see if I can read it directly from how it was written. But in general, people are asking, how about arts and sports to do this restorative work at school? So I'm, I'm kind of looking for it. It's just that we have such great questions and so many, but I'll leave it at that. Just in general, sports, arts into implementing these in schools. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I will say, you know, secondary world, this is sports is probably more what we do than what Michelle's team gets to do in the, the elementary world. But um, it's we don't look at those as separate. So if you are a sports team within our school, you're part of our restorative community and all of those things go together. So we would expect and we support our coaches and all of the people that are in that the same way that we do our teachers to make sure they're trained and they understand that. Um, in those trainings, we always talk about fair, fair process. I keep coming back to fair process because I think that's a really important one is our coaches having fair process with their kids and things like that. Are they being restorative when kids act up and do the wrong thing uh, in that moment on the field or in the practice, in the in practice, whatever it might be, and being restorative through that setting as well. Um, our athletic directors who are in charge of all the sports, they've all been trained up to this point. Next year, all the high school ladies, the middle school ladies got trained last year. Um, so it's 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 not separate. So it's like hard to answer the question because it, it's all encompassed. Like nobody is other within this process. We are all in this together. There's There's no separation. Darren, I know that you have, thanks, Brandon. <laughs> Darren, I know you use music intentionally to sort of, you know, to create that pathway to connection. Do you, do you want to respond to Claire's question um, about, um, you know, where do the arts and physical, you know, um, sports and things like that fit into this work? Yeah, one thing, especially when you have those um, art teachers, um, that are involved in circle conversations with students, once again, providing an opportunity for uh, equitable voice and input. It's one thing to say, okay, well, today we're gonna to learn, you know, piano, and tomorrow we're gonna to learn horns or what have you. But what about how they're feeling? You know, bottom line is, when it comes to arts or sports, implementing the restorative conversations in the circle process. Not a lot of time, just enough time where everyone has a voice. It's amazing what's discovered from their interest. You know, there are a lot of, uh, I'll put myself included, who've been doing, let's say, music for a long time. But it wasn't until I started getting feedback in circle conversations with students about technology, which is what led us to build the My Music Ed app. So what happens when, when teachers or students that can 
uh, be non-musicians, maybe not even gifted or talented, but you can open a drum page. And on the page, you can click on each instrument. It'll tell you, it'll tell you what the instrument is, but more importantly, at the top of the page is a circle starter right? Um, there's a prompt there to create dialogue and relationship building in those arts areas. Maybe it's an art teacher. Okay, well, today we're going to paint. However, let's circle up. What would you like to do? How are you feeling today? What colors are your happy colors? What colors are your sad colors? Integrating the circle practices in those classes. And, and lastly, um, having art circles during non, well, obviously during non-instructional time in the classrooms just to find out what gifts and talents are in children so they will have a voice. Maybe they don't know. Maybe you need to take time to um, have them explore through, you know, a lot of schools have smart boards and things of that nature, but make it part of a short conversation. They will talk to you, but then the next step is how can we implement those things based upon the student's interest with now the teacher not telling them what not to do, but what we need to do to keep them interested. And more importantly, how academics play a good role into that. <laughs> Darren, I love that story of the app idea coming from a circle conversation. <laughs> That's a powerful. That's a powerful story. Thank you for sharing that and all those other connections. Um, Claire, do we have time for one more question? Yes, and I think we have a perfect segue from one, what Darren was just mentioning. Um, we have a question. I'm, I'm just integrating several of them. There's a question about there's a focus on academics on schools. How do we deal with that? And I just want to mention also one of the questions is 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 regarding um, how do we talk about the reasoning behind restorative practices, not just the implementation, you know, of the practice, but the reasoning of why this is good not only for students but for society in general. Um, this is very challenging, especially with schools needing to focus so much on academics. So. I'll leave you with that. Oh, I think Michelle, do you have your hand up? You I, I do. Um, <laughs> it, it struck me with, you know, that whole piece about the school. I think, you know, and the why behind restorative practices. For me, I always try to, um, to when I'm talking to our educators, to think about they want to have a voice in their building, right? They they want input. They want they want the fair process. Um, because they're the ones doing the work and they know what's happening best, right? So it is that sense of you create voice, which, which creates belonging. And that's our basic human need, right? We need to feel like we belong in order for things to be meaningful and for us to be engaged. And from that then comes agency to do things in your classroom. I think there is, for me, this is seamless with restorative practices from circles um, to fair process even with our, our smallest of children, right? Um, if you can give kids voice in what they're learning through instructional strategy um, and comprehension and allow them to bring their outside, their home lives, their culture, their life experiences into the lesson, that is giving them voice and they can feel like they belong in that environment. Um, and what is magical, and I've seen it happen, is when everybody in that classroom feels like they belong, then they feel like they're empowered to share who they are, right? And that translates to now I have this Velcro hook to attach my, my new learning to, and now it's meaningful for me, and I can take this and move on, right? So it wasn't a one and done and it's lost because I've, I have meaning now. And now as a learner, I have the agency. I've learned how to do this. I can continue to do this day after day, whether my teacher does this with me or not, right? That to me on the academic side is how we empower not, not only our teachers, but our kids at that level. So, um, which again, I think then goes back to the culture of the building. This is, then the, the building begins to be restorative. So, um, yeah, that instruction piece at home with me. So whoever asked that, thank you, because I think we're seeing that in the work. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. I appreciate that. Is there, would anyone else like to comment on that question around that balancing of instruction? So Darren, I see 
Yeah, and um, and just make, making sure that I'm even being clear, you know, from the arts, you know, side of it tying into academics. The arts, nowhere in this conversation I mentioned of, you know, becoming a music teacher or pushing students to become musicians or things of that nature. This is a tool that creates, you know, how many students beat on desks playing drums or like to sing and gifted and talented, but it's a school to actually spark academics, excellence in the mind. What do you mean by that, Mr. Bell? Okay, so in music, you have to count. So if we're, you know, doing a song or something, you have to read. And the whole idea is, so now that we finished this class or this circle, I need you to go do better in math. Or maybe let's look at the other side. Let us also keep in mind with restorative practices, there's also the positive side. There are a lot of students that are doing well and we can't leave them out. So the circles aren't just about just addressing negative behaviors. And that's the one thing that I noticed early in my career prior to being introduced to restorative practices, I was doing work centered around targeted groups. Who's been suspended? Who has the most referrals? You know, but then once I was introduced to restorative practices and started realizing a building wide approach to making sure everyone is getting attention. We don't want someone to act up so they can come get this circle time. The bottom line is connecting through the arts, through the sports, and also having academic expectations creates a, a bigger thirst um, for the classroom to do better, to strengthen my relationship with my teacher. Oh, I wanna sing, I wanna do this kind of stuff, but yeah, I need to be able to read. I need to be able to add. It plays a big role. It plays a big role, arts and academic sports and more. Thank you, Darren. Thanks so much for adding that. Um, I think we just have time for a quick go around and farewell. Um, have about five minutes left. One of the questions that um, you guys had created was as a as a final round was some final words about the heart of this work. So from each of you, maybe if you could share just some final words uh, about the heart of this work um, as we say goodbye to each other. And could I start, Brandon, can I start with you? And will Michelle, I'll come to you, Darren, and then Claudine, you can wrap this up. Yeah, uh, I guess a, that's a pretty deep question. Um, hopefully I can answer it to a, uh, to a level that's adequate to the depth of the question. Um, I would say the heart of restorative practices is, in, in my opinion, is for all of us to individually reflect on how we treat ourselves as an individual person, how we think about ourselves, how we treat ourselves, and then in return, how we treat others whenever we have interactions with others. Um, that's that's how I look at it the most, is that um, it's all about individual ownership, that agency, that voice, and that belonging. Do I have positive thoughts that I have about myself? that I see myself as part of the community and that I treat others as though they're part of my community as well and our community so that's together. Um, I really look at it from an individual perspective. I just think that ownership in this restorative practices mm -hmm. process is the most essential thing. Um, looking for others to fix it or looking for others to do it the right way, I don't believe will get us there. I think us modeling it, doing it, and then helping people get there with support, love, and, and patience is the most important thing we can do. Thank you, Brandon. Michelle? Um, so echo everything Brandon said. Um, around uh, this district, I am I think people associate this tagline with me, kids can if adults will, right? So we have, I have people send me photographs all the time. We trained um, an entire school uh, our, uh, our individual schools that we're training in August. In September, I got um, a text message with a, a picture of a group of kindergartners outside at recess in a circle on their own. And the teacher's comment to the principal was, there was a ringleader, right? Hey, we're going to do a circle. Let's all sit down. Now, what should we talk about? Right? Kids can if adults will. Thank you, Michelle. Darren. Yes, um, I will wrap up with um, restorative practices must be essential to the school design and the core of reimagining schools. Okay, Restorative practices are intentional in relationship building and can assist with behavior and allow for practical movement towards positive behavior. I'll close with when restorative practices are intentional 
and become the core to the culture, there is movement with proper professional development involving the community and building wide staff, a change will come. Thank you, Darren. And then Claudine, the last word from you. I think the heart of the work is in the heart. And I think so many teachers come to this field, to the classroom, broken. We show up because we want to love the little us that was in the classroom. We want to be the teacher that we didn't have or the teacher that we did have. And I think it's really important to remember and remind us all that like when we do our own healing work, it is one of the most powerful things that we can do because when we are healthy, happy, and whole, we can love our kids to reach that same place. So the heart of the work is in our own hearts. And when we are happy and healed, we can share that with our kids and create better, stronger communities. Thank you. Thank you for those words. Um, and thank you so much for your willingness to come to this conversation and to share so openly and honestly and uh, insightfully um, some of the challenges and some of the successes you've experienced. So from everyone at IRP, uh, thank you so much for being part of our conference this year. Take good care. Uh, officially, Claire, do you need to um, take the space for a moment? Yes, I'm not going to take uh, more than a couple of moments. Please join us at 2 p.m. Eastern for our closing session. I do want to ask you, since this is our last panel for the conference, I would really like to invite you to give a round of applause, not only to our incredible panelists, to our incredible language interpreters. Philippe and Joel have been interpreting into French for all of our nine panels. Chris and Mark have been interpreting into Portuguese for all of our nine panels. And Victoria has been interpreting into Spanish for all of our nine panels and interpreted into English for, our, for Alfonso for yesterday's panel. So thank you so much for everyone for making this possible. We're going to have posters and exhibit hall open in about 10 minutes. So go check that out and we'll see you at two. Thank you so much for being here. Take care.